Hello, my Milton family, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope that this week has found you well, that your heart was at peace this week. And that's actually what I want to talk about this week, because the next Advent candle that we are going to light in this Advent season is the candle that represents peace. I think for, uh, for a lot of us, uh, peace is quite elusive. I think it's something that really is hard for us to get. And uh, I mean, there are times in my heart where I have experienced peace. But then, you know, it always happens. Right? When, once you try to, once you find that ultimate peace, it just so seems to happen that you kind of lose it the moment you find it. It's one of those elusive things. And it's really quite interesting that in the Advent season, we... You know, the lighting that candle represents peace. And, you know, and it, it, it is, you know, theologically speaking, uh, there is this whole celebration of the coming of the Messiah. But if you read the book of Isaiah, uh, which really alludes a lot to Christ's coming as Jesus, there's also a lot of language about judgment. Right, so you know, part of uh, the wonderful part of of the coming Messiah and the Savior is that the Savior comes to save from something and someone or some people. So the people that the Messiah is saving uh, us from are the people who are going to get judged. Right, so naturally, if there's a language of salvation, then there is a language of judgment. And so when there's a language of judgment, which is, by the way, if you read the Bible, it's pretty violent, Uh, and 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 that's why you know. If there was no salvation or if there was no gospel message and it was just that violence, then yes, God is an awful God. But we say God is love because God gives every, makes every effort to let us choose our sort of... Uh, our salvation in a sense. Now, I'm not going to get into details of, you know, predestination or all those things. So if you're really, you know, theologically minded and I have all these thoughts, uh, feel free to come to me and talk to me. Uh, This isn't something that you can just say in a single instance. And it's not something uh, that you can just say, oh, I believe in this. Therefore, I'm going to view my build my life uh, you know, view and my theological views upon that. So it's a more complicated thing. So I, I don't want people to think too deeply into what I just said. Uh, but anyhow, going back to the topic of peace, you know, all everything that Isaiah kind of points to really doesn't point to what we think of as peace. And then when we look for peace, uh, more specifically, even the biblical definition or the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. So even as we seek shalom, what what really ends up happening is it really be, becomes quite elusive, actually. And that's really what I want to talk about is when we have our own views of what peace are is, and if peace is just a feeling that we have in our hearts, then we are probably mistaken about the peace that is used in scripture, the peace that has been talked about uh, throughout the generations of the church when it comes to the peace in Christ. Uh, And what I want to say is, yes, peace ought to give us a comforting feeling uh, and the peace in our hearts, but the feeling is not all that peace is about. And I just wanted to talk to you about that just for a little bit, just the topic of what peace is. So peace, like I mentioned before, the word for peace in Hebrew is shalom. So you kind of read from this way to this way uh, in Hebrew. So it's the other way around. And basically, in essence, because of the root word uh, in which it is based off of, it kind of represents three things. Or a lot of commentators or biblical scholars say that it represents three things. It represents completeness, soundness, and well-being. So a lot of us, when we think about peace, especially the English word peace, a lot of us really think about, when it comes down to it, our well-being. If we think that we are going to be well taken care of, or that we will be good in the future, then we think we are at peace. Uh, And, you know, I think it ultimately boils down to that. 
Uh, even when we think about some things that are bad that's going to happen with us, we say we are at peace because we know at the end of the day, yes, it's going to hurt, but it's really not going to diminish our well-being uh, to the point where it's unbearable and unlivable. So a lot of times when we think about peace, especially in the English language, we really think about our well-being, the well-being of our soul, of our heart, of our our health, of our finances, these things we say that we are at peace. Now, the things that really we don't think about, and this is why uh, peace is so elusive to us when we just think about peace, is because our well-being, because we live in a fallen, or uh, for another term for that, I think the more I guess politically correct term for that is uh, we live in a separated life from God and God's full kingdom. So what happens is well-being is quite elusive. Sometimes we are well, but sometimes we're not. Um, we lose the ones that we love dearly. Uh, we lose our health. Our health fails us. You know, even even our, our our children, as we see them grow, we see them get fall ill, and there's just a lot of things that really hurt our well-being. Uh, it's not always going to be a constant. So uh, that's why it's so elusive to us, or it seems so elusive when we don't have the idea of what peace is biblically, and more importantly, what peace is when Christ is in our hearts. So the two aspects I want to really focus on today is completeness and soundness. So what about soundness? I want to I want to do that first because it's really important. Soundness means, right, as as you all know, it's if if something is sound, it means it's based on something. Right? So the peace actually is based on the hope that we have. You see all these advent uh thing themes are always linked together and the Bible is always interconnected with each other and one of the things that we need to understand is that there is a soundness. We have peace in our hearts even though our well-being may fluctuate the soundness that we have is in Christ. And that's the only thing that really, I think, can really uh, help us. Because at the end of the day, if we base our soundness, a lot of people are really happy. Like sports fandom is something that I'm really fascinated with. And we are so happy when our team is doing well. And we think that it's, it's based on the soundness because the Green Bay Packers franchise is sound. The quarterbacking position in Green Bay has been sound for decades, which is just Wow. Uh, anyway, right? There's a soundness to it. But even that soundness, if we do not base it on Christ, on things that were done before and proven before, and, uh, you know, therefore and proven enough, uh, then, then you know, it, it, it also becomes elusive. Peace also becomes elusive as well. So the soundness of our, of our peace really is focused on Christ coming to save us as a human to understand us to sympathize with us to reach out his hand where we were we did not have to go up to meet God no God came down to meet us and that's the soundness that we have in our hearts and I think that is what gives you peace and I say this to you genuinely no matter what happens to you if you accept and recognize Christ if you believe that Christ is God, that Christ came as fully human and came to die for your sins, but because he was spotless and blameless, he was vindicated and he conquered death by being resurrected. If you believe in that gospel message, your peace is built on something that is sound. It is a sound type of God's love that is, quite frankly, not temperamental. So that's one aspect that I really want us to think, especially in this uh, coming Advent uh, Sunday, of what it means to be grounded in our faith and in Christ, the soundness of our peace. That is something that can never change. The fact that Christ came is something that cannot be taken away from us. No matter what people say, 
it just cannot be taken away from us. And that is the beauty of the Christmas season and the Advent season. The next thing I want to talk about is completeness. And I think it's really important that we understand what completeness is. I think the reason why peace seems so fleeting so many times is because at the end of the day, really, I really do believe and I really kind of admire the language of completeness when it comes to peace. Really, we are at peace when something is complete. Right. You can feel that like, you know, like I I hate doing puzzles because I'm not the most organized person when I'm working on things. So what happens is like I leave puzzle pieces all over the place. Right. You know, and like it always happens. Right. It's like this one thousand puzzle, you know, thing. And you're like kind of making it. And then there's just that one piece like smack dab in the middle. It's not even an end piece. Right. Like if it was a border piece, you know, you may be able to crop it out or whatever, feel better. But it's always that piece in the middle that gets missing. And when that puzzle is not complete, there is no peace in our heart. No, 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 no. When there's that one big you know it's just so gaping it's such a small piece it's one out of a thousand but when that puzzle is not complete then we really don't feel peace and I think that's really important for us to recognize where our completeness comes from I know a lot of people who try to find their completeness through other things and it could be quite honorable things as well some people try to find their completeness in life by helping others But then I've also seen a lot of heartbreak from helping others because, you know, we would kind of assume that we'd be able to continue to help others. But at the end of the day, depending on how our finances and how our situation is like, we're not at liberty to freely do so. Other people try to find completeness through their spouse. Uh, I think especially when we're younger in our developmental stages, in our uh, adulthood, early adulthood, that kind of happens. We try to uh, have a significant other complete us. Sometimes we try to uh, find our completeness through our identities. You know, we think if we have a solid identity, if I truly know who I am, then I will find this wonderful and beautiful completeness. Uh, But in reality, uh, any language about your identity or whatever, I think the very fact that they're fighting so hard for it is sort of proof that that isn't what completes them. You know, their identity or their idea of their identity is elusive as well because it doesn't complete them. Else, if they weren't completed, then they probably wouldn't be talking about it. It's like, ah, it's all good. Uh, You know, so... I think it's really important we get the understanding of what completeness is. And as as a Methodist, right, this is really, really important because uh, John Wesley really put an emphasis on this, and it's the idea of perfection. You see, completeness and perfection are sort of the same word in the original language and the understanding that John Wesley had. See, perfection is not trying to get achieve that score but rather it's like completing the puzzle right it's perfecting the puzzle where everything is complete and full and that's what i want to get at we have peace in our hearts not because of the things of this world that complete us but it's because our relationship with god although not fully recognized as complete is a start of a completion that has already been done through the death and res- uh, death of christ on the cross through the blood that christ spilled for you because god loves you you have a start of being complete See, I kind of view this as a Wesley's view of perfection as this. If this is perfection that you see right here, by Christ dying, no matter how much perfect we are personally from here all the way to here, because Christ died, we are complete in God. But then as far as us recognizing it, sometimes it's this much of us, the rest God. We're complete. But our idea of seeking perfection and more completeness, how about we follow God more so there is a bit more of what we recognize personally as being complete and the rest is being completed by God. And then we have this complete idea of being, oh, I'm using complete a lot, a complete idea of perfection, of completeness. And that's what I want to encourage you today. 
It's a lie when people say God thinks you are as beautiful just the way you are. That's not biblical. That, that's, that's a lie. God will accept you regardless of who you are. God will love you by extending Christ's love, that this, this gospel message to you regardless of who you are. But at the end of the day, what we have to recognize is, yes, there are things where we do, where God completes us. It's not just as we are that is complete. No, it's despite who we are, God completes us. And that is, quite frankly, that is what really gives peace in my heart. I do. I do strive to be a better father, but I know I will hurt my kids. I know, uh, you know, in, in my funeral, they would say, man, you remember when daddy did this? Ugh. You know, I know that they will say that. And the thing is, if I viewed my completeness as a human being based on that, then it would be, I would fall short. Peace would be elusive. But I know that they will see me completed in Christ when Christ comes back. And that's the beauty of the peace that I have, uh, that, that we can have in Christ, is that we can be made complete through God's grace and God's grace alone. How beautiful is that there is, there, of course, there is a burden on me to be a better father because the Holy Spirit works in me so that I can try to do that. You know, like God the Father, this language is so uh, controversial because there's so many lousy fathers. Right. If all fathers were like God, the father, then we wouldn't we wouldn't care if God was a he or a she or whatever. Right. It would, it would just be language. But the reason why it's a big deal for some people is simply because of the lousy fathers. But the, here's the thing. But even to those lousy fathers, God completes them. And that's the beauty. That's why we can have peace in knowing God. Is that even in our walks, even though we may fall, it is God who completes us. So I just want to encourage everyone today to think about peace, not just in terms of what I have, my possessions are, or how I am feeling right now, but to really think about the peace, to pray about peace. God, give me, make me complete. Give me that feeling of completion in Christ. May I be firmly rooted and established in faith and in Christ so that that would lead to the well-being that shows in this world now and through this unbelievable well-being that we will have in the future. And I think that way we can really kind of get a good understanding of what peace is. And I hope that you truly gain the peace in your hearts this week and in this Sunday. Thank you all for listening and I hope to see everyone. Uh, we have drive through Communion because it is Communion Sunday. So drive through Communion is until 11.45. Uh, so when I am sort of blessing the elements, that's when you can start uh, from your home uh, and drive up to the church, and I will just, you know, pass you a, a, a small, you know, wine, prepackaged, uh, you know, grape juice and the bread. Uh, and, you know, and Christ's body and blood was spilled. It was broken so that you may be completed through that. Let's just think about that. And let's try to, when we take those elements, I hope that you can really feel a strong sense of peace in your hearts, even in these tumultuous times. Bye.